Well, this is Guitar Business Radio, as we welcome 2019 with our special New Year show, which will include no reviews or demos, and of course, any idle chatter will naturally be edited out. On the other hand, we will be sharing with you some of our most inspiring moments from 10 of our special guests on the show during 2018. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and welcome to the first ever GBR New Year special. In fact, it's New Year's Day in the United States, and we're coming to you again from Newport Beach, California, where, one more time, the weather is exactly what you might expect for this time of year. Cold. <laughs> and I know I'm going to get some pushback on that from folks who live in really cold places, but uh, again, this is California. So, at <laughs> any rate, I originally had planned to do two holiday-like shows, then I decided to do only one. But after I did the first one, it was very clear to me that my first instinct was the correct one. So here we are. And, you know, we always try to end our interviews with some uh, perspective of some kind from our guest. And usually we end up with something that can inspire us in one way or the other. So I picked 10 segments that I thought fit the bill. And I think you'll enjoy these and hopefully get something positive out of them as well. Next week, we'll be getting back to our regular routine as we lead up to Winter Nam in Anaheim on uh, January 24th to the 27th. We'll be there, and I hope to see as many of you as possible if you're there. Also, we've just added something new to the GBR website that uh, I think you may find very helpful at times. Currently, if you're looking for a previous episode of the show, your choices have been fairly limited uh, to either go to the episodes page where you can scroll through all the shows, but it does take a little time because there's so much detail. The other option is the sidebar list, which appears on some of the pages, but it only shows the latest 25 episodes. So we created a new quick and simple complete show index. Uh, this is literally just a list of all the shows but it's on one page. Just click on any show title and go to the official episode page. Very easy to use, and you can find the index a couple of ways. On larger screens, there's a drop-down menu under the Episodes tab where you can click on the Complete Show Index tab. However, for all others, there's a link at the very top of the existing episodes page, so if you get there, you can just click right to it instead of scrolling. So for some of you, I suspect this may be very helpful. One last thing, we always want to hear from you. We always want to hear what you think about GBR. And occasionally we include some of your thoughts on the website. So if you have a minute, just click on the Participate tab on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com. John Page was the co-founder of the Fender Custom Shop and today operates John Page Guitars, and he joined us on episode 15. I asked him what advice he had for folks coming up in the business, and here's what he had to say. So when I look at the guitar industry, I see a rich field like there has never been. You look at how many brilliant guitar builders there are out there now, and I mean brilliant, and they're all over. I mean, my God, they're, they're and they build, you know, a dozen guitars a year or, or 50 guitars a year. Or I don't think there's ever been a, 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 a richer guitar building field than there is right now. So as a young guitar builder, somebody who wants to be in the industry, I would take heart in the fact that you are getting into the richest field ever. Take that as a challenge because you've got a lot of people, your <laughs> quality and, and innovation you're going to have to live up to. But also take that as, you know, exciting that, that there's a place for all those guys. But define your success. Because if you think you're going to get into the business and be another fender, that may not be realistic. So I think that's the main part, define your success, you know, or what it means to you. Because, because if you're not realistic with it, then, then you are going to have, uh, you know, you're going to be disappointed. And I also believe in, in, in follow your dreams, though, you know, because like I said before, a dream without action is just, you know, you might as well be sleeping. So follow it, see where it goes. If it doesn't turn out, at least you have no regrets that you didn't follow it. David Colt is the founder and CEO of Reverb.com. He was with us on episode 21, and I wanted to know where he thought we were going as an industry 
and what his concerns were for the future. Here's David. You know, I, I think like in, in the big picture, recognizing that there's going to be multi-generations of future musicians and the distractions that exist in the digital world that we live in um, for for the sort of the growth of music is probably my biggest concern. When I, when I, when I think of my kids, I think of uh, uh, young chefs today in the foodie revolution, right? And, and I think of gaming, how esports arenas, who is going to be out there touting and promoting making music as a, re, you know, more than just something you do in third grade and clarinet, something that is a life pursuit, something that can be with you and can bring joy to people um, globally. I think that is uh, becoming a big part of our mission is, is that how to get more people engaged in making music, the love of playing with each other at all levels. Like I don't want musicianship to be this, I often ask people, are you a musician? And they say no. And then when I re-ask the question, do you own an instrument? They say yes. So this idea that we could make more people musicians, more people being considering themselves musical and and be part of, uh, of, of, of making the world a more musical place, which is, is, brings so much joy to so many people, is, uh, is something we aspire to. So I feel that this is our first chapter is, is making gear more available and more affordable, um, more global in nature. And our next chapter is helping extends people's ability to make music with each other, get better at making music, maybe helping people book gigs, maybe helping people promote their music. I think there's a lot of different avenues that we can um, emanate from once we've got this core audience of musicians. In episode 29, we had a fascinating talk for a full hour with guitarist Peter White about his long career as a highly successful recording and touring artist. And one of the many questions he answered was, what's the hardest part about being a professional musician? Watching videos myself, I'm sometimes thinking, man, I'm, I've got to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Way too animated here, jumping up and down. Do I really need to do that? But you know, when the music starts... I can't help it, even though sometimes I'm tired as hell and I've been playing, you know, traveling all day, We've done the setup, the sound check, I've done, and I'm now on the second show of the evening and I'm just exhausted. And by the way, this is a big part of being a professional musician that no one has ever asked me, what's the hardest part about being a professional musician is you've got to learn to play when you're exhausted because very often you will be. Yeah. Being a professional doesn't mean that everything is in place. Everything is perfect for you. It's the opposite. Play to your very best. No, the audience who's sitting there don't care how long you've been up. They don't want to hear excuses. They don't want you to say, oh, I'm so tired, I can't. No, they want to hear a good show. So you just learn to play when you're tired. And when the music starts, I just get energized. You know, I have said uh, before that I, I walk on stage feeling like I'm 25. And I walk off stage sometimes feeling like I'm 75. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I put everything into the show. Yeah. Megan Wells is a terrific guitar builder in Northern California, and she was our guest on episode nine. I wanted to find out what kind of goals and aspirations she had as someone with a very long career ahead of her. And here's Megan. I'm not trying to just turn my back on tradition um, because it's what's inspired me to do what I'm doing now. So I do want, um, I want my instruments to have, to reflect that, that my love for traditional arch tops, but I'm a modern builder and um, I have the privilege of working with some beautiful materials, perhaps materials that aren't, you know, traditionally used with arch tops, which is basically just maple. You know, I love maple and I work with a lot of maple, but um, you know, I'm not afraid to try something different. And, and, and I also, I'm trying to build arch tops that are going to attract all different kinds of players. You know, so many, so many incredible musicians tell me all the time, Oh, I wish I played arch tops. And it's like, well, what do you mean? Like, 
you play guitar, right? <laughs> you know, but if they have it in their mind that if they're not a, a jazz player, then they shouldn't be playing an arch top. And that just is just such it's such a shame to hear that because these instruments are capable of doing anything you want them to do. If if they're you know, at least that's the goal for me with my arch tops. I want I want you to be able to play instrumental finger style music on it. I want you to be able to, you know, throw some distortion on there if you want to. Anything like that. I, I really want to break down those barriers. I don't I don't want to put my instruments in some kind of musical straitjacket. And I feel like arch tops above a lot of other guitars are totally in a musical straitjacket. So um, it's kind of that's that's kind of my goal there. You know, people who are who are also they love the tra- traditional arch top, but they're ready for the next phase of those instruments. So that's that's kind of my goal. Richard Hoover, the founder of Santa Cruz Guitar Company, joined us way back on episode eight. He had a lot to say, all of which was quite interesting. But I really wanted to know. What sustains Santa Cruz Guitar Company? And here's what he told us. We uh, touched on a couple of those as we were talking. I was saying I don't do business different than my personal life. We use only uh, uh, responsibly harvested materials. We really are paying forward as we as we do our job. And uh, we're open source. And that paying forward has uh, generated uh, our, our true bank account is goodwill, and goodwill is what sustains us. It will uh, it will do things for us that money can't buy, um, and we get resources far beyond our means in that. So our day-to-day business involves people from uh, uh, aerospace, automobile engineering, chemistry, on and on and on. And that's all uh, from our association and by uh, uh, doing the right things. So we always get more back than we give. So being open source and being um, uh, doing the right thing is uh, really what sustains us. In episode 23, we welcomed guitarist and recording artist Chris Standring to the show to talk about his long career and how entrepreneurship has figured into it. Here he tells us how he sees himself and his career today versus how he saw the future early on. If I look back at my green, ambitious self, uh, age 25, in London, just sort of thinking about my future, I, 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 there's no question about it. I achieved everything I set out to do. And I, I was, it, I mean, you, I don't know how clear you can be in your formative years. I mean, there are, there, there are a few people that were clear. I mean, take Pat Metheny. He was always crystal clear. He wanted to be an artist. He got in a van, you know, in his twenties and he drove around America until he got where he wanted to get, you know, it was, a, it was a little bit different for me because I knew I wanted to be really successful in the music business, but I, I wasn't totally sure I wanted to be an artist. I thought I was going to be a, a studio player or a touring musician, you know, a play on people's records or whatever it was. But it was only when I got here that uh, that, that became crystal clear. But having said that, I always had a band and I always wrote music. Uh, so it, I was going, I was headed down that path, you know. So yeah, I, there's no question about it. I. I achieved everything that that I set out to achieve at whatever point that was, you know, um, and and more, you know. I, I think uh, you know, at some point you've got to reset the bar and go, okay, well, if if I'm still ambitious, what well, what am I going to do? But you know, in my case, it's really just more of the same and doing it better and more of it. You know, I'm I'm still fired up by music, but at the same time. I'm at the age where I naturally want to relax a little bit and I, and I do, and I'm enjoying not sort of, you know, just going crazy every day, just trying to figure out how to be successful. I mean, I think it's, that's, that's, uh, something young people do really, really well. And, um, when you get to my age, you want to just kind of smell the roses a little bit. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do more of that, but at the same time, you know, there are things that I want to do. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm going to be doing anything wildly different. 
But, you know, at the end of the day, I still like making records. I'm doing more and more producing for other artists now. Mm -hmm. So I could be going in that direction a little bit more. Um, But we'll see. I mean, I'm open to what comes in, provided it's something that I know I'm going to do well and keep my interest, you know. Jamie Gale is the curator of the Boutique Guitar Showcase that brings many of the world's most innovative guitar makers in a collective manner to NAM shows and major cities around the globe. And he was here on episode 13. I had to ask him the proverbial question, what's next? And this is what he told us. Some people can look at a career path like mine and go, wow, you know, it's always changing. But for me, it, it's not, obviously I'm, I'm an explorer. Uh, I'm, I'm curious and we're looking to create new things. And I'm often contacted when someone hits a bit of a roadblock because there are, there are amazing guitar makers out there who do incredible things that have never been done before. And when you create amazing things that we've never seen, there may not be a market for it yet. And so I'm often involved in finding that spot for that finding the right customer, finding the right way to show such a thing. You know, we did that at the NAMM show this last year. I commissioned four guitar makers to do art installations, to show the guitar as a cultural icon has exceeded the bounds of its utility. Some of those uh, installation pieces sold at the show, sold for many tens of thousands of dollars. And and that was a huge success. There are guitar makers who who really uh, see themselves as as artists, who their canvas happens to be a guitar. Um, and so that was a new thing that, that happened at the show. And there are many, many sort of new things. I'm opening up conversations with design schools and, uh, and gallery curators um, and, and guitar players, you know, who maybe see themselves as traditionalists, but they see themselves as the traditionalists who play the Telecaster, which in 19, you know, 49 or 1950, which is not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, you know, Leo Fender came to a guitar show maybe. And he said, what's that? And he said, a guitar. And they said, I don't think so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a, I, you know, that's what you take pizzas in the oven with, you know, uh, this slab of wood, you know, and, uh, and now we have traditionalists who think that, uh, you know, that's what a traditional guitar looks like. Uh, and so it's, a, I'm not interested in, just showing guitars um, or selling guitars, uh, frankly, I'm, uh, we're trying to change the way the world thinks. Uh, I want them to be open because I don't think that art should be closed. I don't think that music should be closed. I think there's far more for us yet to discover than we've done yet. Uh, and so uh, maybe not next level, but just I'm continuing the journey. Yeah. Jeff, I'm excited about the things I don't yet know. In episode 33, our guest was Crystal Morris, the CEO of Gator Cases, one of the leading case designers and manufacturers in music, pro audio, video, and other markets. And I asked her how she saw the future for the industry as a whole, as well as for her own company. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, ex- I'm always excited about the industry because it just has a lot of people that are passionate. And when you have passion, great things can happen. Um, there are challenges. You know, I, I, I think that the bigger getting bigger um, and the local stores are, are becoming less and less. And, and I think is, um, you know, that's where people go to see gear, to fall in love with it. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's a little concerning. Um, and there's just some, some trend changes and, you know, what people are interested in. The flip side is that p- companies like Fender are getting extremely invested in creating music makers of the future um, through the NAM organization. Um, lots of great advocacy work. I've gone for years um, up to Capitol Hill to advocate for music education, which is making sure at the you know young ages that, that there's access to it. So there's a lot of things also that are bringing in new people um, and, and really focused on that. But 
I do think it's, you know, it's, it's a changing world and everybody's, you know, we go to restaurants, we see every kid's on their cell phone. It's, you know, the, the free time to, to be as involved in music as it, as much as it used to be. So I do, I do think that's a challenge, but also something I think we're tackling. Um, in terms of Gator, I mean, the opportunities are kind of endless. It's just how to, how to, which ones do you capture and, um, you know, and how do you not burn out your people by, by trying to do too much. So I think that we have an amazing team of designers that I think anything in a case in bag, whatever it is, um, we can, we can really do a beautiful job on. So there's other industries, um, you know, there's outdoor and sporting and other places for us to continue to grow. Um, and then, you know, on the music side, finding great ways to expand our product offering that makes sense and, and are, are nice, you know, neighboring products to what we're doing, like, you know, like the Levy's guitar straps, um, is, is another great way for us to grow. And, as we have these great relationships with our retailers and, you know, we can be like kind of a one-stop shop for them to be able to get all their, you know, accessories and different needs. Well, multi-talented guitarist Bruce Foreman got serious for a moment or two on episode 10 to talk about the business side of things and what it takes to make a career work and keep a happy heart at the same time. And when we ask, what advice do you give young players? He said this. The most important advice I give to young players is be a badass. You know, I mean, and, and of course, whatever that means to that specific person, be the person that everybody wants to play with, be the person that everybody wants them to play on that. You know what I mean? They, people want to be on your projects. You know, people want you to be on their projects. Really just go for it. You know, whatever that means to you, whatever your aesthetic and your, your perspective and your background and your skill set and resources give you go for that, you know, and give fully to that and trust in you, in the, in your instincts and that the world will want it. That's the thing I, but then to kind of go back through your um, question, you know, I do sit with my students and we look at the environment and we try to strategize as to what the best places, like, like making a good business plan, you know, you, you would, you would say, well, this part, this is a good place to, to really get the most benefit for the work, or I can perceive that this technology will take over. So I want to be the first guy on Instagram or something with 20,000 followers. Cause that's where, you know, a lot of this is headed. Those kind of things. Sure. We're always, we're always looking at, at technology. We're always looking at at the cultural trends, because there's, you know, as well as I do, there's going to be a, a huge, uh, and always has been a huge pendulum shift. It's going to happen at some point. Some person will be the one who sets off the whole thing in motion to where, like where everybody was playing electric guitars, then acoustic guitars became the big thing. You know what I mean? And everybody went acoustic and unplugged. We've seen that how many times in our life now? To where exactly, that, that exactly. pendulum has shifted, uh, you know, uh, aggressive music versus pastoral music. We're seeing a time where like, particularly in jazz, vibey music is, you know what I mean? A lot of mm -hmm. music is very atmospheric now, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'd say Bill Frizzell had a huge part in changing the world in that way. And, you know, but I mean, it's going to change back. There's going to be a, an hyper technical, like Alan Holdsworth that'll come along, you know what I mean? And so like, I try to make them aware of where the business is, where the opportunities lie now with an eye on what the future possibilities that are opening up are and being also highly tuned in to the cultural shifts of the pendulum. And uh, there, therein lies being very well versed in historical trends. That's, that's, that's your strength there is to know like, you know, to have a, you know, I'm not saying be like the, be the, you know, world's authority on Western swing or the world's authority on, on the Beatles or Motown or anything, but just to have a good sense of 
or Dixieland, you know, the good sense of, well, you know, this is how the voice leading this music work. This is kind of the way they approach group playing. This is, you know, this is the type of vocabulary that was used, you know and I mean? These are the harmonic things that seem to happen in that style. And just have a, if, if you have that, then you can spot trends quicker. Of course, it, it makes your music more complete and artistic and, and your aesthetic will pull you to the place it needs to be. In our 14th episode, we had a great chat with Tom Bedell, owner of Breed Love Guitars, Bedell Guitars, and Weber Mandolins. He talked about why he's creating customer experiences and not just building guitars. But of course, I ultimately had to ask him, where do we go from here? And here's Tom. Well, first of all, free enterprise is wonderful because in the end of the day, we can we can create products that deliver benefits to consumers that they didn't think about or didn't ask for, but when they get them, they're delighted. I mean, everybody likes to use the iPhone <laughs> as right, an example, right. mm-hmm. but but I'll use the guitar as an example. Instead of instead of just saying this is all that a guitar needs to sound and, and play like, because that's what people are used to buying, and so if I can just build it cheaper, I think we're entering an era where um, today's consumer the, the 20 to 45 year olds, they're curious. They, they care about the company, the company's values, who are the people that drive the business and who are the people that build the instruments and what do they think about it? What's their lifestyle like? Um, what are, what, what is Breedlove doing different than another company that might make me want to experience it? Because the younger uh, buyer today is an experiential thinking person. So we have curiosity, we have uh, the desire for an experience. So I think today, instead of the market pursuing growth through how do I get more efficient and and build a lower cost mass produced product, is now how do I build an instrument that will deliver a greater experience to the consumer with the values that that consumer would want the company to represent and with the lifestyle that makes them identify with the company and the product. And of course, that's my life. <laughs> that's yeah. what I love. Um, so I see a, a wonderful future for my whole team here, but mostly it's just so rewarding uh, the relationships that we're building with, well, well with um, beginning players, with advanced players, with collectors, just the relationship that they develop with us and we with them. And I think, I think that's where, hopefully, where the world's going. Well, that was fun, and I hope you enjoyed those clips. You know, as I look back at 2018 and the experience of doing this show, a few things really stand out. First, of course, is the effort (laughs) that has been required to produce a weekly show like this. Even now, after doing 47 regular episodes, it still takes a lot of hours each week to get the show out. There's a lot of elements to it, and you know that's just kind of the way I do things. I've told a number of friends in the business... That it seems at times that the, that the hardest part of producing GBR is booking guests on the show. And yet one way or another, it, it gets done. And I have to say, we've had some really terrific guests. Just look at the list. In fact, many of them now come from referrals from others who've been on the show. And that's obviously very gratifying. One of the really positive aspects of all this, frankly, is, well, all the friendships I've been so fortunate to develop as a result. And that is certainly one of the most meaningful parts. If I had to say there was one predominant benefit from doing this, I think that would have to be it. You can't put a price on that, but the value on a personal level is out of the park. So that's something to look forward to in 2019. Some might uh, also ask, has it had a positive effect on your business or professional activities? I, I would have to say, yes, absolutely it has. But let me be clear about something. It's a byproduct. It has to be, in my opinion. You can't go into something like this for the express purpose of making money with it. It doesn't work at this level. Believe me, I've tried. I've tried. The podcast makes no money by itself. It's a cost center. I think that will change, but that's what it is. The truth is, you first have to love what you do and do what you love. You have to do it well to the best of your ability. And you have to learn and grow with it and get better as you go. I've tried to do that as well, and that actually seems to have worked. What's the most important thing I've learned from GBR this year? 
Well, there's probably more than one, but what stands out is value. You've heard me use that term a lot. If you love what you do and you do what you love, you still have to create value if you want to add it to the professional success column. So I think that has to be a focus. Have fun and create value. The rest will pretty much fall into place. And you know, as I think about that, I'm once again reminded of how I close each show. And let me just share something personal with you folks. I do my best to run my business and live my life by these words. Stay positive. So important. Stay focused on the destination. Absolutely critical. But most of all, always keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks so much for your interest and support in 2018. Have a healthy and happy and prosperous new year in 2019. And I'll see you again on episode 48.